So Ronald Sherman is a trained entomologist and physician who has brought the two fields together in his research on medicinal insects. So this research has proven so successful that medicinal maggots are now used in the US and around the world as a limb saving treatment for serious non-healing wounds. So please let's welcome Dr. Sherman. Hello and thank you for the opportunity to share my uh, unconventional journey in entomology. I'm gonna turn on the slide presentation here so that uh, you can see some, some images specifically about one of the most beneficial flies, I think, is the blowfly because that is used today in hospitals and clinics uh, all over the world to treat serious wounds. Chronic wounds are a big and growing problem and fly larvae can actually play an important role in helping them to heal. So in order to understand maggot therapy today, we should really first take a look at maggot therapy in years past. For hundreds of years, military surgeons have recognized the benefits of maggots in the wounds of fallen soldiers. Soldiers whose wounds were infested with maggots did better, their wounds healed better, they survived their wounds. And so it's really not a surprise that the first person to actually intentionally put maggots into wounds was himself a former military surgeon. He was in France during World War I, and when he returned, became the first chief of orthopedic surgery at Johns Hopkins. He was primarily interested in pediatric or children's orthopedic surgery and tuberculosis bone infections, as well as tuberculosis infections all over the body, were a big deal in the 1920s and 1930s. There weren't a lot of antibiotics for that, so surgery was the primary way to get the tuberculosis out of the bone, and that was fraught with a number of complications. Um, the surgery was not always complete. Sometimes additional infections would set into the deep wounds. William Baer used maggots following the surgery to clean out the wounds and reported that he had great success at getting those wounds to heal. We should take a side step right now just to understand what maggot therapy really is about. Maggot therapy is basically a controlled and therapeutic myiasis. And what is myiasis? It's a maggot infestation in a live vertebrate host. So there are many types of flies and just as many types of larvae. Larvae of the flies we call maggots. Some of those flies and maggots feed on dead tissue. Some of those feed only on dead animal tissue. And the ones that feed on dead animal tissue don't always know whether the whole animal is dead or just specific parts of the animal are dead, but the rest of the animal is alive. We call those dead parts of a live animal gangrene or dead tissue, necrotic tissue. Here is a life cycle of the typical blowfly. The adult lays eggs. The eggs hatch in a number of hours, depending on the species, depending on the temperature. And out of those eggs will hatch the larvae or maggots. The maggots are the main feeders and they'll feed for several days. And when satiated, when full, they will leave the host, pupate somewhere safe because they cannot respond to the environment when they're in that cocoon-like puparium. And a week or two later, they will emerge or eclose as full-grown adults. So this is a 
that was a cartoon. This is what our eggs, young larvae, older larvae, and pupae, the orange brown things, actually look like in our laboratory. Our adults are sometimes metallic green, metallic copper colored. Here you see an adult examining a, a cluster of eggs. The adult females will lay 200 eggs at a time, up to 2,000 eggs in their lifetime. This photograph is a, a, a nicer photo, I think, but it's a related species. It's not the, the same species, but it looks almost identical. Metallic green, adult fly on the right, and the larva on the left. You can see two black mandibles called mouth hooks that help with ambulation uh, and little rows of tiny spines uh, around the larva. And these actually help in cleaning or uh, removing some of the debris of the wound or the corpse as the case may be. Well, if you can control the maggot infestation to optimize safety and efficacy, then the maggots become beneficial. They actually clean the wound. We can control the myiasis, control that infestation by using specific species that are known to be non-invasive, known to be um, interested only in the, the dead tissue and not the live tissue. For that, we primarily use Lucilia or Phoenicia sericata. We also control that myiasis by disinfecting the maggots, removing the germs so that they don't bring any new germs to the wound. And finally, we control the maggot infestation with special dressings that keep the maggots on the wound and prevent them or cage them from uh, roaming around elsewhere. And that's basically what maggot therapy is about and how it's done. Well, maggot therapy was so popular in the 1930s, they called it Bear's maggot therapy after William Bear, that thousands of doctors and surgeons in North America and Europe were using the technique. Many hospitals had their own insectaries that grew the flies and maggots. And if they didn't, the pharmaceutical company, Letterly Labs, was uh, growing them for them and shipping them out to hospitals around the, around the country. The practice of maggot therapy sort of disappeared though in the 1940s with the advent of modern antibiotics. In part, that was due really mainly because of a change in the landscape or the, the prevalence of chronic non-healing wounds. Antibiotics did not so much replace maggots as they were really preventing these chronic wounds from occurring. They prevented strep throat, for example, or a traumatic wound that was infected from spreading the, the germs through the bloodstream to other parts of the body in the, in the skin and soft tissue. But with the improvement in medical and surgical technology, we changed that landscape by the 1990s so that now suddenly we had, not suddenly, but by the 1990s, we had loads and loads of chronic non-healing wounds. Because by that time we were able to keep spinal cord injured patients alive long enough to get pressure ulcers what we were calling uh, bed sores in the early years. We could now keep heart attack patients and stroke patients uh, alive long enough so that they would get pressure ulcers. And diabetic uh, patients were kept alive with kidney transplants and insulin, and they were getting late stage complications like wounds on their legs, which ultimately uh, resulted in 
non-healing wounds, and frequently amputation. So a lot was going on by the 1990s and wound care was getting to be a bigger and bigger problem. And that's what led me uh, at that time into maggot therapy in a more active way. I was by then a fellow in infectious diseases, which is basically a postdoctoral student at the University of California. And I was being asked to treat a lot of these chronic non-healing wounds with the new best, strongest antibiotics. But antibiotics don't go where there is no flow, flow of blood. And the blood doesn't go to dead tissue by definition. So these antibiotics weren't really of any use to chronic non-healing wounds with a lot of dead necrotic gangrenous tissue. So we organized the first ever prospective controlled study of maggot therapy versus the, the best we had at the time in surgery and medical care. What we demonstrated was that maggot therapy removed the gangrene faster than any other treatments that were being used conventionally and they also stimulated the wounds to heal faster. You can see this diagrammatically on the plot on your left. For pressure ulcers, you will notice that the solid black line, which represents the maggot-treated patients, that necrotic tissue is diminishing quickly, especially when you compare it to the control patients, the patients who are getting conventional therapy, as represented by the uh, dotted blue line, there really was no change in the amount of, of dead tissue. And if you look at the healthy red, what's called granulation tissue on the right-hand side or plot, you will see that the maggot-treated patients who's, uh, who are represented with the solid black line again, they had a rapidly growing amount of healthy tissue compared to the control group in the dot, with the dotted uh, blue line representation. The same thing can be seen with diabetic foot ulcers. Again, the dead tissue on the left-hand graph drops precipitously in the uh, black line representing those maggot-treated patients. The blue dotted line stays uh, pretty much the same and the healthy tissue on the right-hand graph grows rapidly as demonstrated by the black line. And in the control group, the dotted blue line stays, um, stays stagnant. We also showed that angiogenesis, the growth of new blood vessels, was rapidly occurring in those maggot-treated wounds. Well, a lot of people were scared with the maggots in the wounds. They said that the maggots might contaminate those wounds and bring new germs. And so we did another study that showed that when you treated those wounds with maggots and then closed them surgically, none of those wounds were contaminated. None of those wounds broke open and drained pus. But if you did not treat them with maggots before, then you saw the, the baseline hospital um, infection rate, which was about 30% of the patients closed surgically under normal circumstances, had infected wounds and those wounds popped open. So in short, we confirmed the three mechanisms of action that had been described with maggot therapy 60, 70 years before. Number one, debridement or cleaning of the wounds, both enzymatically through the maggot's digestive juices, but also mechanically because those rough spots of the maggots are crawling around and dislodging a lot of the debris. They also disinfect or kill bacteria in the wound. And finally, they promote wound healing uh, by a number of mechanisms that still have not been sorted out. Now, facts and figures are important, 
I mean, that's what makes science, right? But what really drives decisions, what makes people take actions are their emotions, the things we see with our eyes and feel with our hearts. And those are the things that made me continue beyond my research to, uh, to where I am still trying to pr provide education and provide maggots for those who want to use them. And some people thought that it might be helpful for you to see what these wounds look like in real life and not just on the plots. So I'm gonna show you a, a case uh, I'm going to show you some photographs of a patient before and after treatment, but I wanted to remind you that maggots really are not yucky. The wounds that we treat are yucky. Gangrene, non-healing wounds are stinky, drainy, and yucky. So if you don't want to see that, close your eyes for a few seconds. If you do, here we go. This is a gentleman whose uh, leg reflects a blood disorder. He's got lots of blood clots that formed. And once the blood clot formed, no blood can get to his skin and the skin dies. He was treated by the, the medical doctors, the surgical doctors, and they were having a lot of trouble cleaning all this stuff out. So they asked for maggot therapy which we used to clean the area. You can see the borders of a dressing in this shot that hold the maggots into the local area. And we continued to treat him beyond that until his uh, skin actually healed, healed over the wound. It's a little pink purplish because he's on blood thinners and leaks blood now under his skin whenever he heals wounds. So his wounds will from now on scar with a, a little bit of a purplish hue and he can bleed elsewhere easily, but hopefully that will stop him from uh, making so many blood clots and uh, killing off parts of his skin or, or other body. Okay, so the photos are over, but hopefully um, some of you now have a better idea of what the maggots can really do to a chronic, difficult to heal, limb threatening wound. That, that fellow was up for amputation uh, had we not gone and, um, and treated him with the maggot therapy. Well, so successful have been the results of studies, several studies and patient outcomes, that in 2004, the FDA permitted the marketing of the first live animal, which was the uh, medicinal maggot. And their uh, indications were that the maggots could be used for debriding or cleaning, non-healing uh, necrotic skin and soft tissue wounds, including pressure ulcers, phenostasis ulcers, neuropathic ulcers, and non-healing traumatic or post-surgical wounds. So quite an array of, uh, of problematic wounds. And today, there are at least 24 laboratories sending out over 50,000 treatments a year to patients in at least 32 countries that we know of. So I think for the rest of my time, I would take you on a tour of my laboratory. Um, before we start though, I want you to realize that when I was just a postdoc, I didn't have much of a laboratory. I had a, a closet, a storage closet, carpet on the floor, no running water. Whenever we needed running water, we would put our stuff on a little computer card and roll it into the bathroom and do our work there. But in, uh, in 2000. I'm going to interrupt for one second. I have a sure. question from Katie. She wants to know if the therapy is painful. Most people, so the question is, is the therapy painful? Most people do not have pain in their serious wounds because the nerves have been destroyed. There are a few people 
who do have painful wounds. Their nerves have been damaged, but not completely destroyed. And for those individuals who have pain when you touch their wound, when you change a dressing or, or don't do anything at all, yes, they, uh, they do have pain during maggot therapy. Not when the therapy starts because the maggots are tiny. They're just a millimeter or two long. But about 24 hours into treatment, the maggots are bigger and they can be felt crawling over those exposed nerves. Usually the pain is easily uh, controlled with analgesics, with pain medicine. Um, but if not, the maggots can be removed early and the pain stops immediately because the maggots don't bite tissue. They have no teeth. What they do is simply crawl over those exposed nerves. And once they're removed, the pain is gone immediately. A full normal course of treatment, I should have mentioned, is 48 hours. They are usually mature, totally finished and satiated, satisfied at 48 hours and can be removed. And so um, another friend is wondering if they can feel it after, how it feels afterwards. So, after the maggots are removed, the maggots can't be felt. They don't have any pain if they did have pain. And the number of people who have pain, depending on the study, is anywhere from 3% to 25% of individuals. Um, interestingly, a lot of people feel less pain after therapy. And that turns out, we believe, to be in response to the fact that there's less bacteria in the wound. So the bacteria that are in these non-healing wounds, these necrotic wounds, gangrenous wounds, they secrete toxins that help actually destroy even more tissue so that they can continue to grow and grow and grow. And they also induce a response in the patient themselves for the white blood cells, the defense cells, to come and attack and destroy those germs. And they too secrete toxic chemicals to destroy the bacteria. So we call that collateral damage. So there's lots of pain going on in the, in the wound for some people. And when we clean it out with the maggots, they actually report not only less odor, and less drainage, but also less discomfort, less pain, because the uh, infections are brought under control. So unless there's any other questions, uh, let's get over to Irvine, California, and uh, the laboratory where uh, this is actually the only laboratory in North America right now that's producing medical grade maggots. So as we enter, we pass the uh, lobby and reception area. My wife is on the left-hand side. Some of the staff is on the right. We're gonna pass through some offices and our uh, conference room library. We have lots of books on entomology and flies, lots of books on medicine and wound healing. But what you see on the cart in the foreground is basically, um, FDA records and rules and logs, which is most of what is done at the laboratory now. To get to the insectary, you have to go all the way to the other side of the laboratory because flies have to, and maggots have to be kept separate from the regular production area that is, you know, um, overseen by the Food and Drug Administration. They don't want flies and maggots crawling around there. So we keep the flies and maggots in the insectary. And inside the insectary, um, we have 40 cages of flies. Uh, well, 40 cages. 10 cages are being washed. Those are the cages up at top. And 30 uh, cages house flies. Marina here is uh, feeding and watering and collecting eggs every day or two. Some of the maggots are fed necrotic dead tissue, right? Beef liver from the store, and it kind of stinks in there. 
but since this virtual uh, conference doesn't include smell, we can actually go into the insectary and see those cages right up close. So the 30 cages are each loaded with 2,000 flies. And 20 of, them are, 20 of those cages are in an egg laying stage. We collect half a million eggs per week. Once a week, those eggs are placed onto beef liver, allowed to grow, and they will repopulate this colony. This is a pure single strain colony that started from just one fly caught in Long Beach, California, um, exactly 30 years and five months ago. In the center column, you'll see uh, under wraps where the maggots are grown and the wrapping uh, of the plastic helps control the odors a bit. The odors are then exhausted directly out of the building. So that's what happens to the maggots that will continue this colony for years to come. But the rest of the week, eggs are taken without exposure to any animal tissue at all and brought to the disinfection room where Julie will chemically disinfect them to kill the germs under a sterile hood. She will then aliquot or place those eggs into sterile containers so that the maggots that hatch will remain sterile. So Ron, um, somebody had a question like what constitutes medical grade? And so is th this process is what is, um... Is, is how you get that quality? That's correct. Um, what constitutes medical grade involves a few other things from the FDA's perspective, but basically um, it is a type of maggot, a species that's known and proven to be safe and effective, and a process that includes killing the germs or disinfection. Now we also have to demonstrate that the disinfection process was effective. And we do that by culturing samples of the eggs in the incubator overnight. And then we have to do some assays to make sure we didn't uh, kill the maggots in the process. If all those cultures and assays proved uh, successful, then we're able to label the bottles and send them out as medical grade maggots. The rest of the laboratory is really involved in uh, other activities, both supportive and somewhat unrelated. We uh, here, here see Marina shipping the maggots. Uh, here the bottles or vials of maggots are produced. We also produce many of the specialized maggot dressings in other areas of the uh, of the laboratory, and we have a number of rooms and lab base focused on research. The last part of the picture, though, is really the doctors. And I, I want to mention that they, well, the, the therapists, let's call them the clinicians, because it's sometimes doctors, nurses, physical therapists, wound professionals of all sorts, and sometimes it's even the, the patients themselves that are responsible for the, the last step in the control process of this maggot infestation on a wound. And what I'm really referring to is the dressing, the maggot dressing. You want to keep the maggots on the wound because, you know, to a, a maggot, the tissue on the other side is always blacker. So sometimes when they clean up an area, or if it's crowded, they might roam around and look for some other stinky area, and we don't want them coming off the wound. Also, when they're finished, they're going to be a bit bigger. They're going to be a centimeter, almost half an inch long, and they're going to want to leave the host, and we don't want them leaving. So we use various dressings to keep them caged on the wound until the therapist is ready to remove them all at once, dump them in a 
special infection control waste bag because remember, even though they were germ-free going on to the wound, they've been crawling around this dead tissue and they're now covered with, with microbes that are potentially infectious. So they need to be destroyed along with all other clinic or hospital infectious waste. They're thrown in what we call a red bag and autoclaved or incinerated depending on state law. So that's basically it. Um, that's the past and the present of maggot therapy and maybe some of the um, participants today will help make the future uh, uh, and design the future of maggot therapy. So with that, I, I think I'll stop my uh, screen share and take any other uh, questions that there may be. Yeah, so we, I do have a couple of questions. So one is, um, how many maggots does it take to clean a wound? The dose for maggots is five to 10 per square centimeter. Um, it's uh, an estimate because you cannot easily count the maggots going on for sure. Um, but that's the dose, five to 10 maggots per square centimeter. Okay, and then we have another question from Mrs. Tyler's class. So how long do the maggots live in the medical grade container before they're shipped to the pair, you know, while traveling? The maggots are highly perishable. They're starving. We give them a little bit of, of media to keep them alive, but it's an incomplete nutritional-based diet. If we fed them properly, they would be half mature in a day and totally mature in two days by the time they get to the, the bedside. So they're really starving. They are to be, they are sent out for only two days. So the first day we disinfect them. The following um, afternoon, all of our cultures are back, our assays are complete, and we know whether or not we could send them out. We'll send them out that day and the day following. So we, can, we have a window of 48 hours. And at that point, they're destroyed. The end user will receive them overnight and they have 24 hours to use them. Some times they can't be used within 24 hours. Will they survive another day or two days, three days? Yes, but many are dying. They die at a rate of about 10 to 20% per day of starvation. So the number of maggots that are prepared in each file is not the same three days later. They're not as healthy three days later. So that's a, a, a sort of a complicated, detailed answer. Uh, let me simplify it. The maggots, once we put them into the container, have to go out of the lab within 48 hours. Once they arrive at the bedside overnight, they should be used within 24 hours. Otherwise, they are sickly and dying. All right. So, um, Edwards has a question. So after the initial 48 hours of treatment, is it repeated if needed? The question is, is the maggot therapy repeated? And I'm going to elaborate on that. The median number of treatments, that is more than 50% of people require only one single treatment to completely clean a wound. There are some people with very deep or extensive uh, wounds, lots of dead tissue, and the maggots only clean the top few millimeters of, uh, of dead tissue at a time, so they will require additional treatments. Um, the average number of treatments is two and a half treatments. Um, and then Katie would like to know what species of fly is used? We use Lucilia, or also known as Phoenicia in this country, Sericata. It is commonly called the green blowfly or green bottlefly, 
but be careful when you collect green blowflies because as I showed you earlier, many species look very similar and some are potentially dangerous. Um, and so how often is maggot therapy used on a daily basis? On a daily basis. I don't actually know in, in detail the answer to that question, except for Christmas and New Year's, where it doesn't seem to be used at all. Um, the other days, um, based on uh, our laboratory's records, we send out most maggots on a Monday for Tuesday delivery and use. Um, it is used frequently on Wednesday or Thursday and removed on Friday. And Fridays is in some centers a heavy use day also uh, if they want to use it over the weekend. Um, I know the number of, of um, maggots used worldwide is about 50,000 spread over the, uh, over the year. Um, but on a daily basis, it does fluctuate and I actually haven't worked out the numbers. Um, so I have a question because um, when we were talking earlier, you mentioned a statistic that really impacted me. So how, using maggot therapy, how um, many amputations are prevented? Published studies of patients whose wounds failed to improve with conventional treatment and are now scheduled for amputation. But given maggot therapy as a last resort, published studies show that 50% or more of those patients are able to avoid amputation and heal their wounds uh, with the maggot therapy. So I thought that's so amazing. So <laughs> I'm glad you uh, were able to share that fact. Um, okay, so Jay, who is nine years old, has a question. He wants um, you to explain again why they are starved and why they are destroyed. Yeah. So the maggots that are used are very, very rapid feeders on dead tissue. They don't bite. They don't have mouths with teeth. They secrete their digestive juices into the environment, normally a dead body, dead animal out, uh, outside somewhere. But the dead tissue on a living host is the same to them, tastes about the same to them. And they suck that up. Now, in real life, you know that there's also many other scavengers around, birds and hyenas and coyotes and all kinds of other animals that also detect the odors of a dead animal and are going to scarf that down too. And they would uh, totally eat and kill the maggots if those maggots were still on the body. So the flies that we use are incredibly fast at detecting a dead body within hours. And they're also very fast at consuming what they need and then running away. And so they can finish feeding in like 40, 48 hours. Some of the longer ones, maybe three days at most. They're totally finished. That's, that explains why these guys leave the host before any other scavengers are coming. But it also explains your question. If we fed the maggots and we can't get them out for two days and then it takes overnight to get to the bedside, they'd be fully grown and they're not gonna want to eat the dead tissue on the patient anymore. So the only way to keep them hungry is unfortunately to starve them. Most labs will give them water. Our lab gives them water and some nutrients to keep them healthy, but not allow them to mature to the next stage so that they're still able to uh, secrete their digestive enzymes 
feed, and grow, and treat the patient. Very cool. And so um, Mrs. Tyler's class wants to know how long you've been working with maggots. Well, uh, I have been probably playing with maggots since I was a child. Um, and that's much too long. Uh, my first research was mainly book research, literature research in 1983 with a, I was a medical student at the time and worked with a plastic surgery resident, Ed Pector. Uh, we uh, actually started that project in 1981. So what's that, almost 40 years ago. Um, the first time I started collecting maggots from patients' wounds, patients who came in with wild type maggots already on their wounds, uh, was shortly after medical school, 1983, 1984. I collected those for many years. And then finally in 1990, 1989, 1989, I had the opportunity to start treating patients with maggots. So I have a question because I'm always interested how people find their paths and explore science. And I love how you have combined entomology. So we're hearing from a lot of entomologists um, this week, of course, with Bug Fest, but you combine entomology and medicine. So were you always interested in bugs when you were a kid or like, how did you find this path? I've always been interested in everything. Uh, especially the natural sciences. So as a child, I collected bugs, I collected rocks, I collected seashells, um, and I was fascinated by it all. In ninth grade, English class actually, I had to write a paper about a hobby for which I had passion. And I'm afraid I didn't have the same passion about rocks or fossils or, or seashells that I did about bugs. And I think it was in ninth grade that I really recognized that insects were, uh, were my primary um, interest, uh, science interest. So much so that uh, by the time I had to choose a college program, uh, I chose entomology for my major music as my minor, uh, studied at UC Riverside, which has a fantastic entomology program, actually learned to, uh, about insectaries by working in the insectary to earn my um, college tuition, uh, then ended up at uh, going to medical school because I, that's what I wanted for my profession. I got to medical school and all the students asked me, why'd you study bugs? What does that have to do with medicine? That has nothing to do with medicine. And I said, yes, it has everything to do with medicine. So many diseases are uh, transmitted and affected by, by insects. And my original intention through medical school was to get into parasitology, tropical medicine, international health that did not pan out. And um, this research project sort of distracted me uh, from, uh, from the 1990s until now. So that's, that's the long course of how I got interested and stuck with it. And you know, no path is straight. Our paths are uh, go, go everywhere and anywhere, but I was always, interested in things and open to new ideas and, and new passions. And, and this is pretty much how I got here. That's so wonderful. And I love that because I do feel that most of our paths are twisty, right? Um, okay, I have one last question from Edwards. So how many labs provide the medical maggots? I know you said that you're the only lab in North America, but are there other labs below? So there are about 24 laboratories around the, uh, around the world. Ours is the only one in the US. 
and the lab was really established in 1990 with that first fly from Long Beach, California. There is a very large major uh, laboratory in um, Wales, in the UK, which merged with another laboratory in Germany a few years ago. And they provide the bulk of maggots in Europe. There are also laboratories in uh, the Netherlands, Poland, uh, Czech Republic. There are laboratories in the Middle East, Israel, Egypt, Iran, um, probably by now Saudi Arabia has one or two laboratories. Asia has a number of laboratories, Japan, Korea, uh, China, uh, Australia, New Zealand uh, have laboratories. Uh, so there, there are a total of about, oh, oh of course, I uh, almost forgot, um, Mexico. Um, um, Brazil, Colombia, um, Argentina. So there are a number of laboratories around, around the world. We published our methods back in 1996 when there really weren't other laboratories because we could not send out magnets to all the people who were requesting them. They're, they're highly perishable. They won't survive transit halfway around the world, number one. And number two, it's better to use a local species um, and get people locally involved. So we published all the methods in 1996 so that other laboratories could uh, pick up that article and, and uh, start their own insectary. That's amazing. Um, okay, so Katie has a question. Are you still into music? <laughs> uh, I was very much into keyboards, uh, classically trained, um, played uh, classical music, re Renaissance music, played in jazz bands, and uh, actually was a music teacher and accompanist to uh, help pay for college uh, initially until I, I got that. And even while I had that insectary job. Thereafter, I um, didn't practice uh, as much as I should have. Uh, I expressed my interest in music, working in radio broadcasting, actually, as a programmer, um, public radio primarily. And I did that for many years. Um, now, uh, my uh, passion is satisfied only by listening to, to music. I don't play uh, at all anymore. All right. Well, I think we got all of the questions from the chat. This has been an absolutely phenomenal presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Sherman, for sharing this amazing thing with us. And I think that um, I hope that as we go along with BugFest, people understand and realize how amazing and beneficial flies are. Um, I think a lot of people have negative perceptions of flies or these annoying things you swat, right? But, but I think we're showing that flies really, you know, flies save lives and, um, and how they are really special and we should take care of our natural world, take care of our flies and all our bugs and everything else. So um, I wanna thank you for that. And with that, I'm going to um, do a shameless plug for our BugFest t-shirts. So um, every year, of course, we have BugFest shirts. Um, and this year you can get them at bugfest.org. So please, uh, if you haven't gotten one, or if you join the museum or re renew your membership, you get one for free. So that is our pretty good deal. Um, so that's at bugfest.org. Um, I want to thank Dr. Sherman. I want to thank all of you for being here today. And I also, you know, if you feel, feel, um, feel motivated, we would love donations. Um, you can just go to the museum, naturalsciences.org. It pops right up on the homepage. Um, and that's it. And please join us for more 
buggy programming the rest of today and all the way through Saturday night. So go to bugfest.org and check it all out. And if you haven't done your 